2,000 years ago, a remote island was discovered out in the middle of nowhere. A massive pit lies right in the middle of it, with an entire city cropping up along the outskirts. The origin and purpose of the hole is unknown, with ancient relics and unusual creatures unable to be found anywhere else calling it their home. The unknown shrouding the nature of these creatures and items has drawn the curiosity of many adventurers over the years, tempting each and every one of them to brave its depths and to test their mettle. And yet, despite their best efforts, nobody knows what lies at the bottom of the pit. They don't even know if the bottom of the pit even exists, and this is primarily due to the curse that lingers over it. While going downward through the abyss is difficult in and of itself, the return trip is what makes the entire situation so daunting. The further that an adventurer goes down into the hole, the worse the effects afflicted by the curse when ascending. Spanning from nausea and dizziness when rising from the first layer, to completely losing what makes you human, or ultimately even losing your life rising from the lower layers. This is the abyss, an unforgiving landscape that presents dangers beyond comprehension, yet also beauty beyond the wildest imagination. The abyss has to be one of my absolute favorite premises to ever be portrayed in any form of media. The depths contain both aspects of a dark reality along with childlike wonder in a way that is truly special, and makes for one of the most perfect settings of an adventure I have ever seen. Now, coming from somebody who has played through the likes of the original Piglet's Big Game, this praise isn't to be taken lightly. Both are masterclasses in world building, while also featuring protagonists that facilitate their respective stories super well. Rico is one of the chosen ones for this adventure, and she acts as the happy, go-lucky ball of energy whose biggest desire is to delve into the deepest layers of the abyss. Now, this desire is essentially considered suicide to the rest of the world and its people, and they would definitely be right to think this way. Luckily, Rico happens to come upon a robot boy who she later names Reg. He has no recollection of anything that happened before meeting Rico. He is, however, extremely capable in a physical sense, and makes up for the fact that Rico is... Well, a small 12-year-old child. With their various motivations in hand, along with their combined intellect and brawn, they embark on a journey into the abyss to discover the truth of their world. Now, the fact that our characters are so young and inexperienced when it comes to the world around them is obviously a detriment to their safety, but also means that we as the audience get to learn about the world with them. Every new location, every strange creature, every moment of wonder that our characters experience, we get to share in. I found myself constantly having the same reaction to beautiful sights as our characters did, and that's a testament to how invested the show had me by the end of it all. This investment is a double-edged blade, unfortunately, as it is not always shits and giggles as our characters make their way into the old pit. We are constantly reminded that our protagonists are not the predators in this world. They are the prey, and a sense of danger is showcased through the use of broad shots. Not only do these shots amplify how massive the abyss truly is, but also gives off a feeling that something isn't right. As if something is always watching our characters right behind the camera. Now, you may be wondering, Nick, I thought we were going to be talking about how beautiful this show is, yet all I'm feeling is paranoia and a sense of dread for our eventual main character's demise. And while that is most definitely the case, the danger of the abyss helps to give the entire adventure a sense of inevitability. This adventure is only going to last so long. We're only going to see these places one time, because once our characters pass through them, there's no turning back. I found myself appreciating the areas 10 times more in this case, trying to take it all in before we move on to the next unknown. You always hear about how time gives life meaning. If we had an unlimited amount of time to do whatever we want, there would be nothing forcing us to appreciate what we have in the moment, because... Eh, we can just come back to it later. Our characters don't have a lot of time, and because of that, we only have a handful of opportunities to take in what the Abyss has to offer. And good lord, is it beautiful. I don't know if Jesus himself descended down from the heavens with the sole intent of drawing the backgrounds for this show, but good god, I would believe it if somebody told me it was true. I've heard a lot of people compare the general art style to what Studio Ghibli pumps out, which is probably one of the biggest compliments a studio can receive. I found myself playing a game throughout the show's runtime, where I would close my eyes and pause the show at a random time, only to find out that practically every shot would make for an amazing background on my second monitor. I also feel the need to stroke the music composer's ego as well while I'm at it, because it is just that noteworthy. Made in Abyss may be one of my favorite soundtracks ever in an anime, and not only because Kevin Pankin absolutely crushed it out of the park, but also how each song was used. It's like the animation staff all gathered around to listen to the soundtrack, collectively thought, holy shit this is good, and decided to dedicate entire scenes to appreciating how good it is. 
Because, well, that's basically what they did. Montage scenes with our characters acting in silence while the music dominates the scene happens more than once, and I almost found myself enjoying these parts more than the regular show because of how perfectly the music and artwork synchronize together. These scenes are perfect examples of show, don't tell, and this method of storytelling helps to build up the mystery surrounding the abyss. You aren't told what to expect when going down into the abyss, because nobody in the show really knows what to expect past a certain point. This is important because, after all, Made in Abyss is a show about adventure. If you know everything that's going to happen before it goes down, there isn't much to look forward to. Being pleasantly surprised whenever you find a safe area, or your gut sinking at the discovery of a dangerous creature is what it's all about. You don't know what's awaiting your characters further down in the depths of the abyss, and while this definitely serves as a source of anxiety, I can't help but get excited at the thought of discovering something amazing. As perfectly wrapped up by a quote directly from the show, a longing for the unknown you see is something no one is capable of keeping down. Just like how I long for a second season of Hunter x Hunter, wishing to learn about something brand new is what pushes us forward in our everyday lives. This primal instinct is showcased perfectly through our characters and the abyss, and one of the reasons why I get excited just thinking about what's next for the show. As of the time that I'm writing this video, I have yet to watch the Made in Abyss movie sequel. To say that I have high expectations would be an understatement, considering how great the series has been up until this point. But I have a bag of rocks in the address of the author's house in case anything goes wrong, so no worries there. Anyways, I think the point I've been trying to get across can be summed up something like this. This show is beautiful, the music is beautiful, the art is beautiful, I am beautiful, and you're pretty cute too I guess. Made in Abyss really is a special anime in my eyes, and I hope that I was able to scratch the surface on what makes the show so beautiful. Have a good one, everybody. See